here's a bowl. And as you can see, there's a ball that's on the side of the bowl. And now, what we're going to do is to watch what happens as we put this in motion. We're going to let the ball roll down the, uh, into the interior of the bowl. You'll notice there's a hole down there. And so it rolls down and falls through the hole. If we put a second ball in the same place, it does exactly the same thing along exactly the same path. We put a third ball there, it does the same thing. Now, the fact that all of these balls do the same thing if you put them in one place is a result of classical physics. Classical physics says that if you put an object in a certain position in the same way, it will always follow the same path. And that's what we see in this idea. By taking the mathematics from the world around us and applying it in a hypothetical world of other dimensions. If you know the famous little book, Flatland by Edwin Abbott, its goal was to help you to visualize extra dimensions using pictures and words. The first person who proposed that the Earth was a sphere at the center of the universe, a mathematician, and a philosopher. To see why the Pythagorean theorem is true, a simple diagram will help. So here we have one. Here you can see we have a couple of lines. And there's a green line, and we're going we're gonna to do something with this. Uh, and we're going to actually figure out something about its position. Notice that under the green line, we can account, we're going to have a bunch of boxes appearing. So let me first of all set this in motion. Ah, so there are green and blue lines. And we can see that we have a set of boxes there. Now, you can see that the, the length of the green line and the length of the blue line are the same. The green line is the base of a square. The blue line is the top of a square. And because they're both the same, it means the two areas are the same. In the bottom of this transparency, you have a little equation. It says the area of the green is equal to the area of the blue. Now let's continue all of a sudden to go this point. What you see now is that we have three boxes. But what we did was to take the green line and simply lift it up. Now, that creates uh, the green line. Well, it's still there. And since we lifted it, its length didn't change. But we created a new line by lifting its edge. And we've colored the square associated with that line brown. And we still have our blue line. When we lifted the green box up, if you look very carefully, and let me run this backwards a little bit, You'll notice that as the green line goes up, the blue line had to shrink because it had to stay directly under it. And therefore, the blue square had to shrink. Now, you'll notice our equation has changed because now we see that the area of the green is equal to the area of the blue plus the area of the brown. And the remarkable thing about this result is that no matter how I orient the green line, the area of the green is always equal to the area of the blue plus the area of the brown. Central Nevada may not be fit for man nor beast, but it's just right for testing nuclear warheads. And on February 2nd, 1951, the Atomic Energy Commission detonates an atom bomb 30 miles southwest of Groom Lake, now the newly established 200 square mile area called the Nevada Test Site. It is the archetypal American West, wide open spaces and harsh conditions where only the most rugged of individuals have settled and survived. There are no cities here. Towns, if you can call them that, are few and far between. And the only sounds that disturb this pristine wilderness are rattlesnakes, coyotes, and jet aircraft. Highway 375 is on the eastern flank of the Southwest Test and Training Range Complex. At its center is Nellis Air Force Base, 5,000 square miles of earth and sky that's known as the military's private playground. Here, the Air Force's version of Top Gun exercises take place. It is the nation's most secure, most clandestine military installation. UFO experts claim it is also home to captured flying saucers and alien corpses. Tremendous things have happened out there that uh, will probably never be told. The site has long been the subject of bizarre rumors about extraterrestrial life and extraterrestrial death. Someday, what happened at Area 51 will be made public. And the public will be shocked about what was done in their name. 
I have been a senior research engineer for Howard Hughes, Texas Instruments. Nevertheless, uh, we've been uh, we've been working for some time now in order to determine where the next energy levels are going to come from, and we have identified that indeed the galaxies are being impelled apart. Mm -hmm. Uh, we used to say at increasing velocities. Okay, I have a. I need your hand. This is a, a sander tube, and you're going to catch these. These are magnets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now do notice that this is copper. Mm -hmm. It does not care about copper at all. It mm -hmm. is not like iron. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Th this one just straight through. Right Less on through. than a second. And this one. One thousand two, two, two and thousand three, three one thousand four, one thousand four seconds. <laughs> We see our bowl with, uh, well, this time we're going to put uh, several balls on the lip of the bowl. Watch what happens as they roll down into the middle. Well, as you can see, they don't all travel along the same path. In fact, they can travel along different paths. Now, why is that? Einstein's work is only a slight modification of Newton's work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but we 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 do understand that uh, Newton's work has well Newton's work, for example, Newton says uh, um, says uh, says anything that's in motion tends to remain in motion, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so I have something, and I'm taking it I'm taking it around counterclockwise, mm -hmm. and see it and and what Newton said is true. He just wants to go around and around and around and around and around. This particular thing is called a celt. It is not, it's clear plastic, there's nothing in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to take it around clockwise. It says, no, I don't want to do that. It's just like my children. I will do it my own way. How did it go the other way? Precisely. A Newton's law. Is that because of the rotation of the planet? or? Well, there's, there Can I try are, that? you may. In fact, first so of all, send it around counterclockwise. Okay. Kind of this is called one. this is called a cell. It is celt, C E L T. What's in it? Okay, okay, there we go. Nothing's in it. Plastic. Okay, now take it around clockwise. Okay. And it says no. I and it goes back the same number of turns you sent. Oh, well, I've never seen now anything go, like now that. Now go out stronger. I know. See, I'm looking for the exception to the rule. Mm. You have to. You have to. If you can use language, you really need to convert it into mathematics. Yep. Uh, it's a kind of wave, but it, the thing that's interesting is that it combines two different oscillating objects, or objects in quotes there, or more formally fields. Uh, there is an electric field and a magnetic field associated with light. Remember, I told you it was a game of leapfrog, so you have to talk about both of them. On this animation, what I've done is try to show you these two uh, objects, these two entities, these two quantities that we call fields. The blue balls, which you can see laid out along the x-axis, you can think of as electrical fields. The green balls, as you see laid out among the z-axis, which is up and down, you can think of as a magnetic field. And then as a wave of light goes by, the two of them actually oscillate together, and there you can see the electric field sort of vibrating in this plane and the magnetic field vibrating like that. So that's what light is. It's a, it's a dual vibration of electricity and magnetism. And that was Maxwell's great discovery. Here's a picture of a string. This particular picture I have is of a closed string. And in a moment, we'll set it into motion so that we can actually watch it moving. And we imagine that we've deformed it. And now let's set it into motion. There it goes. As you can see, it's oscillating back and forth. But one of the interesting things about these oscillations is that, as you can see where my cursor is right there, the string is actually not moving at that point. That point of no motion is what we physicists call a node of vibration, a point that's fixed even though the extended object is moving. And as you can see in this picture, the node, there's not just one node. So here's one at the cursor here. There are other nodes, so let me go to another such node. You notice I can put my cursor there, and I'm always touching the string, even though it's vibrating. So this particular string, this closed string, the one that is mathematically described by this picture, has nodes in it. And now there's something very interesting about those nodes. 
they all sit at the same place as we watch the string vibrate. 